Brian and Tom are joining. Uh, Zaniba can't make it. So you can't make it. No, I don't even know if Brian would. He have also a hat on Jack. <laughs> 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 okay, Kevin says it's almost up. Dang it! Now I feel like I need to go get. Oh, the meeting, meeting is now streaming. I'll get a hat. Hat. So, Rose, if you get a hat, I'll get a hat. I'm getting a hat. <laughs> <laughs> Starting a revolution. <laughs> I love that it's a meeting. That's very official. Yeah, very. I, I still don't see it on this Facebook page. How are we doing? Oh, wait. Oh, here. Fine, guys. Oh, there we are. We're here. <gasps> we're on. We're on. <laughs> oh, it's just me. Okay. Wait. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, we're all on. I could only find a baseball cap. <laughs> hey, close. Oh my it. gosh, we're a little bit delayed. Jill and Rose, I'll okay. join you. you know Jeff is here. Jeff is here. Yay. Yay. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, Lily. Hi, everybody watching. Um, thanks for joining us. Everyone got their hat. I don't have a hat. <laughs> oh. Okay. Oh, no. You're special, I have a buddy. Video, and I have a scarf. I brought my rock and roll scarf. Ooh, oh, I have one of those too. Great, Julie. <laughs> Why was that so easy for you to grab? Like, was that just around you at all times? <laughs> I was no, I was planning on wearing it and I took it off and then I and then it's here. Uh, oh well, it. I got another, we got another scarf. Catherine's got a scarf. We'll be scarf buddies. Yes. Oh, oh that's a boa. Yeah, I was like, that's it's more than a scarf. That's a Catherine. Yeah, that's a boa. So we all have our, our, our boa scarves and hats of all sorts. <laughs> and we're all all over the place so um if anyone's joining us i don't know if anyone's watching yet but if you are <laughs> Wait, how do we know people are watching oh 16 people are watching i'm looking on i'm looking on facebook live 16 Everyone. people are watching yeah say, welcome welcome and um oh i gotta turn off the sound here okay so can you hear me all Yes. Oh, great. Oh, awesome. Um, so for everyone joining, I think you can make comments and ask us questions and, and such. So get in those comments and we'll answer any questions as they come up. Um, this is Theater Moves. We're trying to figure out what to call this. We're trying to do it every Friday night. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us tonight. This is the company and creators of Interstate. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Very. <amazing. laughs> so um, I'm Lily Chun Crystal. I'm the artistic director of Theater Moo, and um, and then I wanted to introduce Jack Ruler, who's the artistic director of a Mixed Blood Theater, who premiered Interstate. And nice Jack trip. is in, um, gosh, uh, he's in the bottom left corner of your screen. Oh, there's Tom. It's, it's Tom is here. Hi, Jack. Thomasy. Oh. Thomasy. Hello. <laughs> Sorry for being late. Wallaby. Oh, is she running around? I just took a screenshot. Can I share on line? Yeah, of course. Yes, please do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I also my racism as a virus sign. Oh wait, hold on. Hold it yeah. up. I'll take a picture. I'll take a picture. Wait, I'm hanging up, but you can't read it. Look at it. Hold hold oh. still. My son made it. Wow, his looks way better than mine. <laughs> you, yeah, did you have to write yours backwards too? Oh, oh, mine's not. Oh, I have to. You can barely see top. mine. <laughs> wait, wait. Here's my first I, I version. I forgot that. I, I forgot. Um, high point down. All points to Lily's. <laughs> <laughs> mine is a little, mine's backwards. I see. Anyway. Um, if you all don't know, there's a there's a movement going on on Facebook and Instagram and all that good social media stuff of of um, trying to stop racism in this, in this coronavirus. So all the API people in the house and other and our allies are um, fighting the fight to stop racism against Asian Americans in America. We have other fights to fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, born, anyway. Oh, Timothy! Yes. Did you print yes. that or write that? 
what was that? Uh, I printed it on one side and then it was backwards. So then I traced over on the back side of the paper. <laughs> it's only backwards to you. I see it right. Oh, yeah, do you so see you mine right too? Oh, one. yeah, I do. Oh, is this mine right? Side? Right way. <laughs> yeah, they're all right. It, it, it looks right to us. Oh, oh great. Awesome. <laughs> okay, great. Like, calm down. So, <laughs> Paul, Paul, right too hard. Cole wanted me to say that my son Cole's 10. He's the one that made the sign. It's amazing. It's a very good sign, Cole. Very good. So, Cole, they like your sign. Very we good. Keep holding That's it up. Fun. Wait, keep holding okay. it up. Wait. Oh. Everyone hold it up. One, two. Oh, we hold them up. Um. Hold, hold it up, Tom. Wait, hold wait. We're all taking a picture. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Good job. Yay. Brilliant. You guys, there is a new question. Should I read it? Yes. Okay, from Carrie Judd to the whole cast. All right. I saw Interstate twice at Mixed Blood last weekend and I am so thankful. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, Carrie. Oh, hi, Mom. <laughs> How much of the show is based on actual events that are autobiographical? Melissa, and this is also a kit, a question from Melissa and Kit. Who are the artists and people in your lives that inspire you and who are your musical and poetic muses? So maybe before we, thank you so much, Carrie. You're amazing and we love you. Um, and uh, um, let's, let's, <coughs> excuse me. Oh my God, I don't have coronavirus. Um, <laughs> no coughing allowed. I'm coughing a little bit still. Um, uh, let's, uh, Kit and Melissa, can you, for the people who haven't seen the show yet, can you tell us about the musical and what the story is? And then we can ask about how much of it is actual events and autobiographical. Uh, what's that? Uh oh. I, I think Kit, maybe you're maybe you're below Kid on the gallery. It's different for everybody. <laughs> um, sure. So Interstate is a semi-autobiographical musical that follows Dash, played by Kai, which I think is over here. Um, yeah, Kai. Uh, who goes on the road, who he's a trans spoken word artist who goes on the road with, with Adrian, lesbian <laughs> singer songwriter. Um, <laughs> and uh, they're, they're going on the road uh, as the band Queer Malady um, on their first cross country tour. Um, and their music uh, inspires um, Henry, a 16 year old trans kid from Kentucky played by Sushma somewhere. Um, who is going through, you know, uh, I guess his own, figuring out his own gender identity. Um, then he goes on a quest in act two to, uh, to see his heroes in person. So that's what the show's about. Cool. And, you know, um, actually let, yeah. let's talk about that question from Carrie, but before that, we should probably introduce everybody. I think everyone can see on Facebook live who everyone is. So, um, Melissa and Kit, because the names are there. Melissa and Kit are the writers, composers. And then um, Jack is the, we introduced him, artistic director of Mixed Blood. And Catherine, uh, Kat, Catherine is uh, the production manager there at Mixed Blood. She, she was in rehearsal with us every day. Um, and then Kai played um, uh, Dash. And Sushma played Henry. And Rose played um, uh, Adrian. <laughs> and, um, is a lesbian <laughs> just like Melissa <laughs> <laughs> right and then Meredith Tom and I played um, various roles in the ensemble and Jessica is our uh, fearless director yay Yee! she came out from San Diego to uh to direct um and now we're all we we closed on we closed early we're just a run in to the end of the month we close early um, on Saturday due to um, current events, which we all know about, which is why we're <laughs> meeting on Zoom and having our reunion here. So now we're all over the country in New York and San Diego and Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, and one of our people is like in a woods, like a cabin up in the woods and he's not here right now, but hopefully he's okay. Um, <laughs> I think he's doing okay. Yeah. Funny yeah. story, we accidentally broke his toilet when we went to the cabin last weekend. Zero percent surprised. And, uh, <laughs> but it was fixed today. And he oh, said good. it's even better than it was before. So really, we should be saying you're welcome. You know? <laughs> yeah, they went to stay with him up there for, for a day or two. Did, so did he have only one toilet or you broke his only, only toilet? Only one. <laughs> oh, no. 
Okay, and we no. broke it 10 minutes after we got there. <laughs> oh, no. So I hope it's okay. I mean, I hope it was okay. All of you there with a broken toilet. You know, At least you won't go through we got a lot closer. Break. I know, I thought of that top. I thought of that. What did he say? At least they won't go through toilet paper very quickly. <laughs> oh, no. <Okay>. Nice. <laughs> uh, but I'm bumped. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so so the first question is, uh, um, what, what, and I actually have this question too, what if the show is autobiographical and what's, what's based on actual events as opposed to fiction for Kid and Melissa? Uh, let's see. So, um, a lot of people <laughs> wanted to play factor fiction with us after the, after they saw the show. Um, and just to preemptively address it, we can comment on anything in the show except those hands. I can comment on those hands. No! <laughs> I'll comment on any of it. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, I want to hear it. For those who don't know, those hands is the pornographic portion of the, the show. pornographic portion. <laughs> All right. I All quote right. unquote. It's it's just the more cool. look at rousing, arousing, vividly arousing sex scene. <laughs> yes. yes. As the so press tell, us, tell us about the, the fact of all of that then. Inquiring minds want to know. Okay, well, I'll just, well, I'll just be more general, I guess, because Kit is <laughs> sensitive about it. Uh, but <laughs> so a lot of the show is just based on us going on the road and like a lot of issues that we did have on the road, like the fact that we are, while our friendship was imploding, like we also had a lot of pressure just from the community to like, I don't know, to like just exist and to be there and to keep going. So I think that was one of the things that I felt was like what we tried to convey that was really true to, to that time. Um, and honestly, at that time, uh, I think like there just wasn't a lot of trans and queer like Asian representation, um, which there, which I mean, I think there's a lot more of now, which is really wonderful. Um, but yeah, but at the time it was sort of like either we 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 kept going or we disappointed a, a lot of folks so that that part of it is is very true um the details of it i think i think one of the things kit that you always say is that like your your mom is actually very much like the dad <laughs> in the show um and my mom is like a little bit like the mom but like not not exactly and like i never went to law school or wanted to go or was forced to go so that was not true. <laughs> good but the unrequited <laughs> love story our friends moms is that, is that all fact yeah the what the unrequited love story uh that was absolutely a fact no yeah. comment Kid, Kid no comment Kid, you wrote a show but how can you not true. comment on it <laughs> you did this to yourself true you can't write a play and then not comment you're monetizing on it now <laughs> yeah yeah so like like melissa said in, in um we went out on the road in 2008 the same year as the show is set in and i think to expand upon some of that pressure that outside pressure we like I feel like we kept feeling from the media and from other people that like we had to be really perfect, like queer and trans people. Um, and, and because there was so little representation, we always, we, we, had, we really felt the added pressure to be like really perfect folks while um, what was happening was that we were just totally falling apart and it was hard to go on the road financially and interpersonally and logistically. And so, um, yeah, uh, like the, I, I'd say the show ends where where we maybe ended two years later in like right before we uh, didn't talk to each other for a very long time. I mean, they, they sort of made up at the end of the show. Sorry, spoiler yeah, for those who haven't seen true. it, but, um, but like that us. wasn't the case. I think, I think for us, it was like much longer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm so popular. <laughs> <laughs> People are watching you now, Meredith, and, and calling. <laughs> well, thanks for that um, a little bit of insight. Um, Rob Dunkelberger also had a question. And Rob is one of our biggest fans and um, ha is a critic here in the Twin Cities and wrote a great review for the show. Thank you, Rob. Um, he wants to ask, um, and I think this is for Jessica and perhaps Jack and Kit and Melissa. 
Um, can you talk about the casting of the three leads and the necessity of casting trans people in trans roles? Uh, who do you want to and who do you want to answer? I, I think maybe Kit, Kit and Melissa can talk first, and then I can add on to that. Maybe you guys start with that. Okay, Kit, you go. Yeah. Well, um, so the show has been in development for about eight years, and along the way, we have always, um, you know, we we've always wanted to have trans actors and non-binary actors in the trans and non-binary roles, and I'd say that goes across the board for all the shows that we work on together. Um, we tend to write, uh, actually, we only have shows with trans leads. So it's yeah. a very important part of our work. Yeah. Um, and uh, in terms of like finding those folks, I think for us uh, and in theater in general, um, we found this when we were trying to uh, make sure we reached everyone in the community when talking about the mixed blood production is that like, um, sometimes we have to go the extra mile to reach our communities. Um, folks don't always have, uh, feel comfortable going to the theater. Folks don't always feel, um, have access to the internet. Folks um, are not, uh, they're not in the places that I think the theater is always usually at. And so um, when we were doing casting, um, we also wanted to make sure that we reached as many people as we possibly could, which in involves quite a bit of like grassroots um, outreach for both promotion and for casting. So a lot of like Facebook group posting and uh, trying to activate the phone tree word of mouth um, and, and just like trying to like see who's out there far and wide. Um, and then I think like, uh, the other folks can talk about what it, what the process was was like. Maybe Jessica. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so this is all to say that it's it's absolutely necessary. It's important to the writers. It was important to us. It was important to Jack that we all that we do what we need to do so that we can cast it the way it should be cast. And we were so fortunate to have such an amazing cast that you see uh, most of them here today. Uh, because it's also with with it in addition with just with when it comes to we have to ca we're looking for a certain identity uh, with in addition to that they also uh, need to be a musical theater actor <laughs> and all the things that that go into that and which is you know to be a triple threat anyways is is a feat for an actor so so with all of that. I, at the same time, it's, it's just interesting. We've, we've had, I'm sure Kit and Melissa have, are constantly in these conversations, but especially for this, you know, it's you, one might say like, oh, it's so hard. It's like, it, it's, it's not hard. You just have to put in the work. When you put in the work, you will find, we will, we will find the cast and we did. Uh, so it's, it's really no question of, of uh, you know, we just knew that it was gonna, we need to start earlier. We need to, spend more time reaching out and and we did and I think we we came up with uh, we end up with a fantastic not only cast but a community um, that was our company of interstate and I'm just so thankful for for everyone not only for their time and their talent but just for giving so much uh, of their talent but also their personally uh, to the, to this production yeah thank you um I think mean, the question of casting is really interesting. And, you know, Jack, you do a lot of diverse shows, all sorts of shows that um, mix blood. And I know, you know, for those of you who don't know, at Theater Moo, we, we do primarily Asian American shows. And, um, and it's really important for us to, if, if the cast calls for um, Asian American characters, that we cast those people with you know, cast those roles with Asian American people. Um, and Jack, being that you do all sorts of types of shows of all different kinds of um, demographics, like, is that something that's, that's, that's something that's really important to you too, right? As the artistic yeah, director. Yeah, tries to live at this intersection of authenticity and virtuosity. So we get uh, the actor for whom the role is written and that person is also gonna be at the top of their game. So as we went into this, that. Uh, Kit and Melissa had done this national search that led us to Sushma, which was a super blessing. And then 
as we sat down for auditions on the first day, Kai was the very first audition. And we're like, oh, this show is going to be a piece of cake audition. <laughs> and yet, the last contract we signed was the day before rehearsals began. <laughs> Meredith, <laughs> the white woman. <laughs> We're, we're, there are very little of us. Uh, <laughs> no one is looking for us. We're, we're, no one wants us either. So it's, it's all very hard for us right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I want to put out there that, you know, er, sometimes I think people assume, oh, it's an Asian show or it's a black show or whatever or that, you know, um, you have to look really hard. And sometimes that does happen or that, there, you know, the people may not, not be as accomplished because you're trying to fit this very specific thing. And I want to say that, um, you know, for the quality of work that that Mixed Blood does and that um, the creators do on this show and, and most theater companies do in America, that, you know, the, all the people that were in this show, um, you know, are bona fide, really experienced artists in their own right, and that they have a right to be on that stage. And they earned they earned their place on that stage. So um, I don't want to make it sound like uh, we had need to sacrifice something to have diverse work in American theater. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's see. Carrie also had the question of who are the artists and people in your lives that inspire you, musical and poetic muses. I think that's also for Melissa and Kit. Um, yeah, we can answer that, but then we can toss it out to everyone else too. Yeah. Um, because uh, I, like, I, I feel like everyone, every person's contribution to the show is carries a lot um, with them. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm embarrassed to probably say my uh, artistic um, influences and joys, but uh, I really love Disney. I love Moana and I love Coco. And I love Princess and the Frog. <laughs> and a lot of the ones I grew up with as well. That's so sweet. It's like you started with the ones that was like a couple of years ago. <laughs> so recent, but yeah. And yeah, and I like the ones I grew up with too, but um, it's probably because I'm rewatching a lot of them, which is why they're on the top of my mind right now. Um, yeah. And then... I mean, I think like throwing it way back, I'm like really inspired by a lot of poets, a lot of spoken word poets and spoken word artists in the Boston area that I like grew up admiring, like Ioka Okwao and Marlon Carey and Reggie Kabiko and Kelly Sai, like all these like OG spoken word artists um, are really part of my like, uh, just in, in my, my, my blood. Yeah. I find this question really, really hard to answer. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm also embarrassed about my answers because I don't think a lot of people know this, but I actually don't really like music that much. Yeah. Um, being totally honest, I like don't listen to a lot of music. Like I, do, <laughs> like, I, I like Carly Rae Jepsen, but like that's basically it. Um, Carly, baby. Love Carly yeah. Rae Love Did Carly Rae Jepsen. Did you see her in Cinderella on Broadway? She was a revelation. I know. I was making fun of I her then, really but then, <laughs> then she came out with emotion, and it changed my life. So, um, but yeah. So I don't listen to a lot of stuff. But I, but when I think about like, oh, the kind of music I write and where it comes from, I don't think it comes from like one specific place. But one thing that I do know is like I grew up listening to a lot of like canto pop and a lot of like Chinese music that my grandma and my family listened to. And of course, like yeah, Disney, and we like listen to like so, like I don't know so, sound of music or something like all Chinese people listen to um but like but I think like for me it's about like being able to um tangibly like remember something and like sing along to it something that's like really digestible and so that's what I'm always um inspired by and like leaning towards but yeah I mean want to open it to other folks too, to answer this question I'll jump in here. So I would say my, of course, my, my biggest inspiration is one of my mentors, Julie Taymor. She's just incredible interdisciplinary artists and uh, directors that I just have a, a bunch of directors I admire that uh, aren't necessarily musical theater directors, although they do musicals, but they play with form. And that's something that I'm continually interested in as a director, since I do plays, I do film, I do dance theater, and then now doing more musicals. And it's not that now I'm a musical theater director, it's that 
I'm always playing with form. And even, even it's interesting, even Kit and Melissa with Interstate, they are also playing with form. It's actually not, in, it, it, it's, I think musical theater has its own rules and either, and Kit and Melissa are constantly sort of uh, uh, interrogating those rules since they since they come as writers, they're coming from a different place. And also me as a director growing, I grew up in musical theater, but then I went into more dance theater and uh, plays. So I'm, I'm coming back to it uh, with all this different experience. So Julie Tamor is a big uh, inspiration of mine. I would say Complicite of the UK, a very physical interdisciplinary company. Um, and I'm also inspired by film. Um, just I'm look, I watch film a lot and I see how that can be translated to the stage. And I do think Interstate is quite cinematic. Cool, thank you. Um, and, and, uh, and on the, that note of process, uh, Lisa Crystal had this question for uh, Melissa and Kit. How did you divide the labor and collaborate? And how long did it take to develop the script how many drafts, how many, you know, what percent was revised? Um, I think for a lot of people who don't, aren't behind the scenes in theater, it's hard for them to understand how long it really takes to develop a, a, a piece. And so I guess that the main questions that Lisa has are, how did you divide the labor and collaborate being that there was two writers on this? And um, what was the process in terms of redrafting and revising? Yeah, so um, we actually, we started in 2012. We actually dug up our very first treatment well, recently, like, like maybe like a week ago, I think we dug it up and we we're like, oh my God, it's like so different. Um, and also want to preface to say that this is the first project that Kit and I had worked on. And so in that sense, like I think he and I are still learning and, and I think like at this point we're getting better and we know like, you know, what we're great at and how we should divide and stuff. But I think it was definitely a learning process over the last eight years of working on this. Um, and yeah, so like when we started performing in 2008, like Kit was mainly a uh, spoken word artist and I did like my songwriting and we would and just like in the show, it would be like there was a poem and maybe I'd do music under it. Maybe I would do like a chorus and then we would perform it on stage. So in, in the show in Interstate, like those show pieces are like written in the same way. It's sort of like Kit would lead that poetry. Um, and then I think like, I, yeah, I would say Kit, wouldn't you say like at the very beginning, maybe like the first few years, it was like, it was like you and I both collaborated really heavily on like the book and the story. Um, and then it was like, mainly like the songs were mostly written by me and then the poetry were all written by you. And then we would like, sort of tweak each other's and I think now over the years it's more blended it's definitely like even with like lyrics like you would make lyric adjustments and stuff um and we would like talk more about like the shape of the songs so I yeah think that's I don't know if you want to add anything or I'd write a scene and it would be gone the next time I open the script yes I would delete your scenes <laughs> right away um <laughs> we did <laughs> We do talk, I do talk about this a lot about how you're particularly really good at getting stuff out. I feel like if I were to write this alone, it would just never get written. Like I would just sit there staring at the page for like days and days and days. But like, but you know, you would write a scene, I would either throw it out or like tweak it very dramatically. And I think like that's, we work well, we work well like that. Yeah, it's true. You do a lot of the fine tuning um, and, and, you know, sort of like organize a lot of the chaos that happens in the writing process, um, which I really appreciate. And I also think like you always challenge me to zoom out to like to, to take a look at like what's happening like holistically in the script, um, which is really great. Um, in terms of how many drafts we've done, maybe for the first five years, you think maybe we did like a draft or two a year um, I've been trying to collect it. I think at the moment, I want to say like it's in the 20s, um, but like yeah. I haven't combed through like all of the in-between stages. But I do know in the last year I was putting it together in just in 2019, I, I think there were eight or nine drafts. Yeah, we recently, it, uh, as we headed into production and um, and did a couple of festivals over the last two years, we really dialed up the rewrites. Um, 
and, and spent a lot of time at residencies um, working on new drafts. Awesome, thank you. And, and Jessica, how much were you involved in sort of shaping once you came on? I think it was this past year or two, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just one year. It's been ex about a year. It's, although it feels like longer because we've just are so close. <laughs> the three of us. Uh, but yeah, yes. I, would, I yeah. would say that uh, very involved in, and, and offering, uh, you know, qu questions, uh, just sort of musings on thoughts about what ifs. Uh, and also offering, you know, thinking about the production and what I think, I think what they're trying to do and what I know I can do uh, in space or on stage and with design or uh, so that that was really, they were just so receptive to that, you know, and I really appreciate that, that uh, I was there, they were there to, you know, truly hear what I, truly to hear what I, what my point of view is. Um, but also we were able to just sort of break things uh just, just kind of dig in together. And I, I really, that's the fun part for me. That's, you know, when people ask me, uh, what kind of, what kind of playwrights do you like? And I say, living ones. <laughs> Cause I, I, it's great to just collaborate and just be in the room with them and just uh, dig in all together. And so, yeah, a very, very, very involved. Uh, and then, you know, then when the new draft comes, it's it's like a new a new baby, and I get to I love it. Brave awesome. brave rewrites that they've yeah. done over yeah. the year. Yeah, and the rewrite. Thank you, Jessica. And the rewrites were coming, you know, throughout the rehearsal process until opening night, and that's really exciting to be part of a new work that's living and breathing and constantly changing. Um, and to get the to, to a question for the performers, Rob Dunkelberger also had a question. Uh, can the six performers tell us briefly their favorite moment from the show of, um, or even from their experience putting the show together? I'll go, I saw the question and I was like, I gotta think on that. But um, I, I think for me, the most valuable thing and something I kind of almost took for granted during the process was being in such an inclusive space with such, knowledgeable artists and people who were so open-minded like I was filling out a form the other day for some submission and I was like wait they're not asking for my pronouns <laughs> and I was like taken aback by that um so I think just that across the board was something I'll really cherish and hope to bring in to the rest of my projects I'm ever involved with um and then yeah yeah what do you guys think Anyone else favorite moments or salient aspects of the rehearsal process that really moved um, you or affected you? My favorite moment of the rehearse of the performance process was being positive that Rose Van Dyne had fallen off the stage um, for a full 30 seconds. <laughs> I don't know how to follow intimacy choreography. <laughs> <laughs> Kai kissed me probably three seconds earlier than he was supposed to. And I was completely taken aback, literally <laughs> and stepped backwards, probably six steps. <laughs> Almost fell off the stage with Meredith looking in the show. I am frozen facing Meredith. <laughs> Meredith is facing, you can see Rose and Kai from where she is. And I'm facing the other way. So we're frozen. And then I just see Meredith's eye just go like, <laughs> freaked out a little bit and I was like because I'm like holding her arm and I was like oh like, did I hurt her like am I about to drop her <laughs> is, she, is she just really in the moment right now like she's really <laughs> <laughs> so I was like is she okay <laughs> oh man but she didn't fall off the stage luckily yeah, no, no. And Melissa told me later though that they both like grabbed each other <laughs> <laughs> The moment much more aggressive in the storytelling. <laughs> yeah, we told. We actually we told Jessica right away. We were like, we were oh. like yeah, I was like, something, something happened. I, I think Kai was the most aggressive he's ever been. I didn't know he was early. Uh, I just thought you made a bold choice. Kai. <laughs> it was. It was bold. That's what I'll say. <laughs> Very bold. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> the rule for actors is always make a bold choice, a big choice. I think for me, like my favorite part of, or my favorite like part of like experiencing this process of the show is like, it was so quick, like it happened so fast. But I think that like, I don't know for me, like in my past experience, like, you know, you don't always get to experience having a community in um, a cast and crew. Like you might not always get close and you might be putting up together a show for like, longer than two and a half weeks, three weeks, and you still don't get that close. And I think it's really lovely when um, you are able to find friends and family within the community of, of the project you're putting together and be able to get close through that intimacy of like sharing a story and telling a story. So I, I mean, I'm, I, I made friends for life during this, this process. So it's, I'm really grateful for that. Aww. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tom, do you have any favorite moments? Yeah. Um, I, I would echo what both of you said already in terms of just the people involved. It was so wonderful just being in that room and in that space with everyone. Like it just felt so good. Uh, another thing that popped into my head was our first preview right during the opening scene, just feeling the energy from, uh, from the audience. Like it was, it was really specific energy that I was like, Oh, this show is like moving people already. And like, and it, 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 you could just feel it. it was palpable in the room as I'm sitting there trying to also like nod my head in time, half lit in the darkness while the real scene is happening. But it, like, you could just feel, um, uh, you could just feel connecting. Uh, that was great. And the end of the show every night when we're all standing and happy again <laughs> and redeemed <laughs> to some degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think for me too, like the last moment of the, I mean, the last note of the very last song is my favorite moment. It's just so, it's so powerful. Like we just standing up there, like, you know, this is us. And I, God, I wish like more people could have seen it. Um, yeah. Cause it's so hard to explain. It's this big number and then we all stand together at the end of the show um, and bring in the audience with our, um, with the last, this last soaring note of the song of the finale. And that was my favorite. Um, it's sort of a moment that brought us on stage together with the audience. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really like the perfect moment to represent the most powerful uh, part of theater, which is to bring the audience and the storytellers together in a in a um, a shared a perfectly shared moment, mm -hmm. so I love that. I, the other thing I love about this show is is that it really. I mean, when I looked around the room that during the first rehearsal, which was our first read through, I was really moved by how um, you know API queer actors and characters can live in the fullness of who they are and um, not have to sort of adjust ourselves to fit a certain character, but it's like, this is me and I, I can be who I am. And I think that's really powerful about this show. And so, and that's why so many people are moved by it. Um, Cause really the, the, I felt like every night, it's hard for us to know, for all of you out there who don't do theater, it's hard for us to know as actors, like how the work is coming across because we're in it and we can't watch it. Um, but it was really powerful to come off stage and talk to people who had seen it. And so many people were moved and touched and just like their lives were changed. It felt like their lives were changed because of the work. And that's why we do theater. Um, and Catherine, I know you weren't, you weren't in the cast, but you were a production manager. So you, you manage all aspects of the design and, and other like Catherine kept us afloat in so many ways. Do you have a, and she was also Sushma's understudy for the choreo oh, call. The dance yeah. call, yes. yes. We have yeah. a dance call um, before every show so that there's a lift in one of the numbers. And so that the actors can, which we all lift Meredith, the ensemble lifts Meredith. So we, we, we um, practice that before the show every night. And um, Catherine played uh, Sushma because um, Sushma sings the main, the main part of the, the lead part of the, the song. So um, Catherine, what was your, your favorite part of this whole process or the show? Was it uh, understanding Sushma? I mean, that was glorious. I mean, that, those words come so fast. I, I, props to you, Sushma, because I never got those down. I did it at least 10 times and I still can't <laughs> get it down to this day. Um, no, I think the the beauty of it was finally having an audience react in the room because I think it was a um, 
a wild process of getting everything together. And once we had everyone kind of in the room to create and have an audience react, uh, it was really exciting. And I think at the last performance, um, I was sitting in the audience and I saw a few very close friends um, and people I know from the theater community locally um, be very touched by it um, and react in a strong way. Um, and that was very heartwarming. Um, and there was this uh, member that we've had for like 20 years and they said, this is one of the best pieces and maybe the best one that I've seen here at Mixed Blood. Um, I wish you weren't closing. Um, so it's it was a beautiful process. And I think to hear the laughter at different moments, you're like, oh yeah, I was laughing at this moment. Um, it, it's really good to have the audience energy in there for sure. Um, it brought a great vibe to it. Awesome. And Rose, did, we, did, did you share what your favorite moment was? You haven't um, yet, right? no, I, I haven't yet. Um, uh, I know that uh, so much of interstate uh, is rooted in the idea of identity uh, in many different forms. And for me personally, um, the identity of being an Asian actor is something that's very new to me, oddly enough. Um, and I've talked about this with other members of the cast as well, but being half Asian or mixed uh, is a very interesting experience, especially uh, in an educational setting, because everyone everyone has a different opinion about what that means of who you are and, and how you should move forward in this world as a theater artist. And especially when most of your professors, at least in my experience, were white, uh, it's kind of hard to know uh, how, how much to take their advice. So I got a lot of advice of, oh, well, you're ethnically ambiguous, so you should play these races but you should never play Asian because you're not Asian enough to, to look like those roles. Um, and so the idea of being a fully formed Asian actor uh, is very new to me. And so I really enjoyed being in an environment um, where that was a given. And I said I was Asian and everyone thought I was Asian too, because I said I was. Um, <laughs> and so even in, in that form of identity of, of race, along with the other things mentioned in, in the show, of course, um, for me personally, that was huge. And I loved being a part of that. Awesome. Yeah, and sometimes people ask me as a theater maker and a director and artistic director, you know, they, they may say, oh, that person who was cast doesn't look Asian enough, or, you know, can we call that person in because they're half, or maybe they're Vietnamese and not Chinese when it's a Chinese play. Um, and my, my response is like, it's not up to me to police the identity that people, people feel they are. Like that's a personal choice for every, every artist and every person. And so it's not, if someone comes in who identifies as Asian and they're half Asian, like they identify as Asian, they're Asian. Like it's not up to us to, to determine someone else's identity. I remember Rose telling me about it and I'm so glad that Rose, that you've like, you have harnessed and like owned your Asian identity because it blows my mind to have anybody, let alone like, cisgendered white people who like tell you like oh you you can play these races but it's like wait, whoa, 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 whoa. who are you to say or and, and and not even not as a theater artist just like even as a person like how can you tell somebody what they are especially like when it's like they're born right like you are born Korean American and like you have that that is yours and nobody could take that away from you you know it just blows my mind. But and she cooks a badass Korean lunch. Oh man, yes, she does. <laughs> Kimchi fried rice, baby. Woo! So if there's any <laughs> doubt about her Koreanness, she proved all she proved that she definitely is Korean by the by the lunch she made for us that on, on Sunday, which is the day after we closed. Oh my god. Last time I was with other people besides my family. <laughs> you were my family that day. Yeah. Oh, miss you all already. <laughs> I know, I know. Meh. Um, so yeah, so that's a, that's a really great, um, thanks for the question. And, uh, there was another, oh, oh no, I, I, I wanted to, um, get to a question earlier from is Perlman. Hi, yeah. I was going to go to that question. Yeah, yeah. Because, because they've been a fan of interstate for a long time now. They, they came to see at nymph. I just want to say hi to them because they reached out being like, are, are you guys going to do it? Are, are you guys going to be part of it? So I'm really glad that they could join us. Um, but yeah, how can we share info about interstate for people who haven't been able to see it in person? I think that's a great question. Um, because I know, I, I hate to bring it up again, but get, Melissa, people have been asking for a guest album for a while now. Oh, that would be fun. Yes, where I directed all the people who want a cast album to is Sushma's YouTube channel. 
<laughs> where you can find many a yeah. songs from interstate. <laughs> Um, I was actually, page. I'm curious about the cast, if you guys would be interested in this, but I was going to make some, uh, I was actually going to make some karaoke tracks uh, for actually a different, different, <laughs> different keys of Loser Dumpling. So everybody can sing Loser Dumplings. Maybe you guys can make YouTube videos of yourselves. Singing. Melissa. All oh my gosh, songs. we're totally doing it. And then people can just find them on your YouTube pages. Yes. <laughs> A million times, yes. Okay, well, yes. those are coming. But I, I, I have, I have, I don't look, and I have why I share on my YouTube channel, but I don't have Hero, so that would be something I think people would want. You don't have Hero? <laughs> I need to sing Loser Dumpling. Um, <laughs> like, you need to do that now. Like, it's in your contract. You need to do it. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that we and we can talk more about that as we as we as we uh, close up this conversation. But there's been a lot of questions on the feed as to what's next. Might we remount it or might Jack remount it? I know that's maybe a hard question right now because theater leaders are um, there's a lot going on and and we're and theaters in crisis right now. So um, you know people are trying to survive right now. So that I know that's a difficult question, but. Uh, but I still like to talk about that uh, before we get off. Um, but uh, is there, um, so in if be besides loser dumplings, is there other ways you're, are you thinking about um, putting a cast album together or going to other places? I know we talked a little bit about that um, in, at your talkbacks, Melissa and Kit, but um, maybe for the, the audience here who wasn't at the talk talkbacks, what, what, what are your plans? Yeah, thanks so much for asking the question. We're really excited about um, what, what possibly happens in the future too. I think for us, a cast album might be a little ways away, um, like an official cast album, but uh, we, we do hope, um, we can't quite say yet where it's going next, but we, if you follow the Interstate page, um, we will update it as soon as possible. And I, I would imagine in the next like two months, we, we may have some news um, about the show. Awesome. Um, and, if, <laughs> and, uh, and, if, and can you tell people what that page is just in case they don't know? Yeah, we're on everything. So we're at interstate musical on Instagram and Twitter, and then interstate a new musical has a Facebook page, um, and then interstate musical.com, um, the website as well. And then you can also probably follow all of us personally, like me, and Melissa um, to, to get the latest info. Although I'm slower than the interstate page, so the interstate page is faster. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of info up there, so be sure to follow that. And uh, a follow-up to that to the, is this question about um, what's next. Uh, they, um, and it's also had a question specifically for you, Sushma, about how have you felt since you've been with Interstate for so long, what has it been like to inhabit the role for different audiences? Um, I mean, it's been, I mean, any chance to share the story and to share Henry is always just like such a privilege. Um, but I think for me, like I, I, you know, being so lucky to, to, to help kind of shape this role, it's been um, just like every time that I do it or perform it, whether it's for like a workshop or like, and then for this production, since Nymph, like, it's just not like deepening the understanding and like, I mean, I feel like it's rare to have a role for this long. You know what I mean? Like, so when you have that chance to like, I would hope that it just gets more, I'm just focused like as an actor to like make sure that the story gets more specific and my choices get more specific. And like, he's more, he's just like more real and more has like this deeper um, backstory in life to him that like is clear amongst all, all the other scenes. So I think like, it's, it's it just, it's been, and I mean, because the story is so good, the response has always been so lovely from any audience who sees it. People just really fall in love with like, with the story and what's his music and like, and Kit's poetry. Like, it's just, it's just, it's been, the, to answer the how, it's been amazing. <laughs> like it just keeps, it just keeps getting better and better. And with all the rewrites and stuff too, just like, it just, it's, it's, it's explosive, it's, it's awesome, yeah. Thank you. Um, there are a couple other questions, and um, there's a question. There's some questions that go back to process and rehearsal. 
And one is in C. Michael. C. Nine? Michael. Nine? Hi, C. Michael. Um, I guess Mary, how do, how do you pronounce their last name? Meng, C. Michael Meng. Meng, okay. Hi, C. Michael. Um, thanks to your question. So the question is how were diverse perspectives and experience culturally, gender, sexuality, artistic, how were diverse perspectives and experiences involved in the rehearsal staging process? And were there any rehearsal room practices that you all used to maintain character, individual complexity, but tell one shared story that worked? And were there any practices that didn't work? Those are two questions. So I guess we can look at the first one first, which is how were diverse experiences involved in the rehearsal staging process? And I think that's for everybody because we're all present for the rehearsal process. Or hopefully present. <laughs> I will say, and I obviously wasn't it part of putting these in place, but the first day of rehearsal, we were asked if we had any um, access needs that needed to be met that day. Um, I'd never been asked that in a rehearsal before, and it I felt really nice to um, uh, hear where everybody was at physically and um, uh, what they needed from. Uh, the space that day and I've never had that before and I don't know if that's a Jessica thing or a mixed blood thing but I really appreciated that in general um yeah that was something new that had never happened to me before I also love that Jessica the first day she asked us for I mean, correct me if I'm wrong Jessica but there were intentions or group goals group in the agreements agreements right and I thought that was really powerful I'm actually going to steal that from you <laughs> Next directing gig, and and um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that, Jessica. What you did? Apologies for the sound. I have some work happening in the house. Um, we hear you great. Uh, <laughs> must be dealt with. Uh, so community agreements. So that's something I do a lot. I uh, for about five years in New York, I worked full time with Ping Chai and Company doing community based work documentary interview-based theater in different communities. Uh, and this is a practice that's really important to us at Ping Chong Company and I've taken it to every single one of my practices, all of my productions and all my classrooms uh, as I'm a professor as well, uh, which is community agreements, which is as a community, because every time we do a production, we are a community, a new community. We create, we uh, have a big poster on the wall and we together decide what we agree to as a, com as, a, as a community. And so we put it on the board. What is safe space? What, what do we, how do we feel about phones? How do we feel about photos? Uh, uh, so just a, a, a variety of things that is important to us as a community. Uh, and it can change. And it's so it, what it becomes is it becomes a community contract. So it's not me saying, this is what a safe space is, or uh, you know, this is, these are the rules of my rehearsal room. Cause it's, it's the thing is, is it, this process is unique because we are unique and we are who we are. So our process will be exactly what it is based on who we are as human beings. And so it's important for all of us to articulate uh, what is important to us collectively and write that down. I, I thank you. I think it's really powerful and important in the room. So, and that, that, you know, inherently allows for different perspectives and experiences to be heard and respected. Anyone else have any other comments about that? No peanuts. What's that? There were no peanuts. Oh, there are no peanuts. So one of our, one of our company has a severe allergy to peanuts. It's me! <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't want to. I'll say it. <laughs> <laughs> Trisha had a, has a strong peanut allergy, so we did not have any peanuts in or cashews the or cashews. Or cashews. Yeah. So, yes. Thank you all for for making that like change for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> especially you, Kit. Have a look. Especially you, Mr. Love. Kit. Why does Kit love peanuts? Because <laughs> and Kit, <laughs> all of us. <laughs> I love peanut butter. Because I think it was that day, day of rehearsal. That day of rehearsal, Kit walks up to the snack table, yeah. the biggest jar of peanut butter I've ever seen in my entire life, <laughs> and with a, with that signature Kit smile on his face, and then our stage manager Raul was like, 
Can't put out no way, no peanuts or cashews. And his <laughs> hand really goes from big to go, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and immediately puts it back in his backpack. <laughs> oh, I laughed so hard. <laughs> oh, I missed that whole thing. Oh, it was the biggest jar. Like, like a massive. <laughs> it was incredible. Yeah, I mean, theater artists love <laughs> peanut butter. I have. Oh, yeah, so sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's so funny. No, you're totally uh, fine. It was hilarious. Um, not to mention that, like, the first week of rehearsal, we were in performance at Theater Moo for Peerless, which Meredith was in. And it's a whole storyline about uh, nut allergies and <laughs> the murder, murder by nut allergy. It was so, so I was like, I, I remember after the show, I was like, Sushma, is that okay? Like, are you okay? <laughs> was it, was it? triggering for you well it made me think of somebody who might want to murder me with peanuts um, oh, I did. i'm also currently um i'm watching smash because uh rose yes yes you you're still it? watching it oh my god you guys i've started i've never watched it i've never I'm seen it i've never seen it or somebody is poisoned with peanuts and i'm like this is two times now where i see people poisoned with peanuts in representation a and now I like might be myself. I'm like, I, I, I'm like, I'm not important enough right now to ever be poisoned with anything. I hope, but also, <laughs> don't when you get to Broadway, Sushma, do not tell your understudy that you're allergic to peanuts. That's dangerous. <laughs> that is, that is, oh, is that why we hide it? One of our company members has so nobody murders somebody. I got it. Well, it's like Showgirls. Did you ever? Maybe that, that's aging myself. But in Showgirls, Showgirls before, steady, yeah. like pushes so them. I didn't know who it was until the that. stairs. That's really funny, Meredith. No, but like now I know. So if I'm ever in like a like a higher level, if if I'm if I'm, if I'm in a big production, and they say a company member, I'll be like, I will keep myself anonymous just in case. <laughs> just in case anybody has a vendetta against me. <laughs> yeah maybe you might want to think rethink your strategy there yeah i usually just out myself because i i i, I feel I, I i just don't because because either people will like because will often from my experience never people keep it a secret people will often try and like sneak it because they, they don't think it's me who is allergic so like they'll still eat it but like like just around the person who don't who they, who they think might have it but i have to be like well no it's me so you have to get away from me <laughs> <laughs> so like <laughs> <laughs> yeah apparently i don't i don't look like somebody who would have a peanut allergy but. here's my husband with uh my <laughs> he's my bartender <laughs> say hi to eric hi eric hey. <laughs> cheers cheers cheers, cheers. cheers. <laughs> before we move on um i do want to i do wanna answer c michael's question and like dial it back to to the writing too um because for Melissa and I, we are uh, really try not to shy away from really specific storytelling. And so um, if in our stories and our worlds, um, if our characters are like queer and trans and people of color and um, have different, you know, viewpoints, like we really try to make that a really important part of the story. Um, and so I think when you center that in your storytelling, the what happens is that like as part of the process other people have to meet work where it's at and that's that's something you can't change like if it's in the book um so yeah I'd yeah say, like, keep yeah, writing your yeah, yeah. specific stories mm -hmm. i also right. want to like commend or i think jessica is a great director for this piece because you work so much with collaboration and that's such a big part of your process. And when you're telling intersectional stories, not everybody exists at the same intersections. And so to be open to all the voices in the room is really, um, I think that brought a lot of great work to the process. Yeah, to, to, um, to speak on that, like being, you know, the two leads are East Asian, but like to be a South Asian person um, in the show and like, and not only to include, you know, South Asians in the show, but then to also be willing to like listen to like 
the cultural things that like we could incorporate into Henry's storyline, like to like just to deepen like the the realness of, of his identity. Like I, I so appreciate you, Melissa, being open to hearing that kind of stuff. Like so even from changing like there are parts of the story, like um, and uh that there's a, a spoken word that Henry has at the end of the show, and like we changed from mom and dad to mom and baba because that's what he would call his parents when and, and like um we, <laughs> I mentioned fish curry in the show. Um and even with Jessica like working with her, like I realized like I was wearing shoes shoes in my room but I realized like Henry wouldn't wear his shoes in his room he'd wear he'd put them at the front door so like to have them be open to like hearing my experiences as like like my personal South Asian experience and to incorporate it with Henry's it, it means everything that you would be willing to listen and, and 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 trust my experience with that so I appreciate you doing that yeah I really felt like um sorry Jessica were you gonna say something well, I just want to add uh to tie this into an earlier question which is that one of the first things I said in the first day of rehearsal is that this is going to be fun and it's going to be efficient. <laughs> I want to add with everything that we're saying right now is that it was also an honest room. Honest with each other, the writers, uh, writers being honest with me, honest to the, the people and the identities and the human beings that are, that are written. And then also actors and and me and actors with the writers being honest with each other mm -hmm. about questions or what's working where it's not working or curiosity. So I, I just I I just truly believe that that is is so essential. And I think a lot of artists are afraid of it, especially when there's a power structure in the rehearsal room. Like, do I say what when I'm not sure? And even for me, I, I think even to the very last moment, even to the final few minutes of tech. Uh, you know, we're all being very honest with each other about what we're able to do and what we can accomplish and uh, what's next. So I, I just want to throw in that with all of this, it's, it was an, you can feel that it was an honest room. Yes, it definitely was that. And I, I really appreciate that from you, Jessica, and also Melissa and Kit for making that, that space, uh, that safe space for all of us. Cause um, I really felt like we all could from the get-go, from their first read-through, that we could all could come in and say, oh, you know, I, I think at least for the, like for me and the mom, because sometimes those those parent characters and shows, not this specific show, but shows in general can be can become stereotypical or one-sided. And and you were also open for to come in the room and say, well, you know, the, the, the actions of the mom, even though they're problematic, they all come from a place of love. And I felt like you all really heard that defense of the character. And um, I once worked with a director who said, you know, the job of the director is to defend the play and the job of the actors to defend the character. And you all were very open for all of each of us as individual performers to defend our characters and to, um, you know, give you feedback about what, what was present for us about each of those characters that we embodied. So I really appreciate that. That's the cool thing about being part of a new work too, is that again, we're all collaborating. So I think all of us individually had moments where we'd say, uh, working with um, the fellow actors in the scene and with Jessica going, what is this scene trying to accomplish in the breadth of, of what the play means? And then if I feel that my character isn't doing what I think they would do in this situation to accomplish what the scene is supposed to say, then we could take that back to Melissa and Kit. And then maybe the next day we'd have a totally new scene that fully supports what it is that they wanted to express, um, which is just the amazing part about being a part of a new work. And also like going back to Rob's question about like the necessity of casting trans people in trans roles. I think when you have a room with people who are cast appropriately in the experiences that like that, you know, you know, gender identity, um, race, like that kind of stuff. Like when you have those people in the room, especially with a new work, it just, when everybody's collaborating, like it becomes a more honest story. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think- And the answer becomes apparent. Yeah, yeah. Like it just, it becomes so clear like that we're just like that with the proper people in the room and like the right people in the room um, with casting properly, like it just deepens the story and makes it better. And like, I think who wouldn't want that, you know? So I think it's, that's also another privilege of- also. I remember there was a moment we were working on this scene where both Henry and Dash are injecting testosterone. And there were like five genderqueer people in the room looking at the scene and going, wait, but the math doesn't line up if 
the testosterone's this, but then it's every day, every week, what, what's going on here? So it's just cool that everybody could speak to their own experience of, wait, this isn't right. Yeah, and all the trans guys in the room learned they were doing their shots wrong. So. <laughs> <Just differently. Yeah. laughs> Is that true, really? Uh, none of us did it the same way. We oh, were I see. Interesting. the whole time. <laughs> guys, like, my way is right. Nope, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I well, I am washing my legs. <laughs> oh, can we please talk? Can we please talk about this? Okay. <laughs> Bear to go. Bear to go. Here's to this, everybody. If you wanna, if you wanna uh, chime in at any point, um, I didn't know until the second day of tech that white people are dirty. Um, I had no idea. <laughs> Um, and Zaniba looked at me, who's not here right now, but she looked at me and went, do you wash your legs? And I went, who washes their legs? <laughs> like, don't you just wash the up part of your body and then let it all like run down? When I tell you like, my no. thought. And then, the, and then there was a whole thing of like, this is why you brought dysentery and smallpox <laughs> and name whatever disease that goes next. <laughs> So, um, thank you to Interstate for um, educating me about loofahs and body wash. And, and scrubbing um, your legs and your feet and getting <laughs> between the toes. So, <laughs> um, Tom, yes, fair, Tom also didn't wash his legs. So, no. I want to just reiterate that it was an honest room, a really <laughs> honest, including <laughs> generous room. <laughs> I was also like, yeah, who washes their legs? No one. The dribble. <laughs> you had your shoes on the table. Jessica is, Jessica <laughs> cannot believe it. See, she was not in the room then. Up and As after. an Asian person, she was like, what? You don't wash your legs? Yes, Jessica, we've gone through this oh shock God. and awe. I wash them now. I have washed them. I wash them now. Yeah. I wash them now. I wash them now. So we were in the, in the this yeah. happened in the women's dressing room. And <laughs> oh my gosh. And then, um, yeah, and Z, uh, Z's like, I think Z and I were talking about like the difference between Asian people and white people. And then Z said, yeah, white people don't wash their legs. How white people don't wash their legs? I'm like, what do you mean white people don't wash their legs? Well, and I tried, said, no, I don't wash my, what do you mean who washes their legs? And I tried to be a bit entire, cool about it. I was, I was like, like, what? I tried to be cool about it. It was like, well, I dance ballet forever. So I think it's a ballet thing. Like, I think it's a dancer thing, like whatever. And literally Z went, you mean the whitest thing in the whole world? <laughs> <laughs> I wish Z was here. We need to like take a look. I know, we need Z. <laughs> I know, I know. Oh my gosh. Yeah, because Z is, see, see, Z is white and she, she's half white. And so she's like, oh, I know all about the white things. Like they don't wash their legs. <laughs> Anywho, so I think Meredith and Tom got some of the brunt of the, um, the, the jokes of the horrible <laughs> scenery. <laughs> Happily. related jokes. It's okay. About time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we love you. That's why we love that you're okay with it. It's really hard for white people right now. <laughs> <laughs> Meredith does not speak for us all. <laughs> <laughs> Tom's like, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, whoa, that was. I, I hope people people like that. Like thought it was as funny as we did. Someone um, commented, "I've never heard of that stereotype before." <laughs> <laughs> I didn't either. Well, I hadn't either. I had no idea that white people didn't wash their legs. Are they Someone white? Said, so shook by this leg washing thing. <laughs> <laughs> what? People, PSA, PSA, <laughs> racism is a virus and walk <laughs> Hashtag, wait, hold on. My oh. husband says he washes his legs and he's white. So oh. I, yeah, I don't know. Watch. Some white people. <laughs> Damn. Leg. Um, so uh, there, was a, there was a really nice comment here and I lost it now. Um, Trending. It's trending. trending. Wash your damn legs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, so, um, so, um, <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, my God. Whoa. Oh, it's, it's hashtag wash your legs and.
Yeah, um, racism is a virus. Racism is a virus. Mm -hmm. Th that's our two hashtags tonight, everybody. Yep. <laughs> Wash your damn legs and racism is a virus. <laughs> Goodness me. So um, there was a comment that somebody in the hospital, not with coronavirus, this came from Rob Dunkelberger. He said, this is Justin from George, whom I'm watching this with in the hospital, not coronavirus, has officially declared the interstate has bumped off Hamilton as his favorite musical of all time. Oh! Dang. So it's real, folks. <laughs> it's real. Um, so I think we, we probably have time for one more question. And... Um, I don't want to keep you, you all too much longer, although I know you have so many things to do and so many places to be right now. <laughs> <laughs> Can we take it off live and just like tease Meredith and Tom for a <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we love um, it. We really that, do. We truly miss it. I've been teasing myself. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that counts as social interaction, I'm up for. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I wish we could we, I wish we could post the video that Meredith or whatever it was the gift that Meredith and 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 uh, Patrick made for on their anniversary. Oh yeah. <laughs> we spent our anniversary um, washing our feet up to our knees. So I guess that means <laughs> in calves, your feet don't go up to your knees. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we spent our anniversary doing that uh, with exfoliating um, body wash. It was a lot. Felt great. They sent, they sent us a, a video saying white people wash, <laughs> this is what we're doing anniversary, white people washing our legs. We were going to uh, go have like a steak dinner, but COVID, so. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. So you stayed home and washed your legs instead. Honestly, it might've been better. It felt great. Good, good. <laughs> you mean staying in or washing your legs? Both of those things. Okay. <laughs> So we have a question from Katie Kavang and it goes back to um, who, who Katie Kavang, shout out to her. She's a, a wonderful playwright herself and is a Moo artist and part of our artistic advisory committee. She asks, um, it's a little bit about another question about collaborating and writing. It's a little bit different than the one we had before from um, Carrie, but it's, or maybe it was Lisa. Um, but what do you think is the main key to collaborating when writing a musical? And were there moments of breakthrough or challenge? Like, could you share some of the moments of breakthrough or challenge? Maybe that's the main question. Because I think you touched upon collaboration before. I feel like recently, Kit, we've been uh, we've been asking Jessica to break ties. <laughs> to break ties? <laughs> yeah. I think that's like when we disagree on something. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think often we like, yeah, at the end of the day, we always want the best idea to win, but like neither one of us is always equipped to make that, that decision. Yeah. Well, I mean, I also think that with art, there's like, it's different, like what's best or what's not. So usually it's just two ideas that go down two different directions, right? So it's not, I think like over the years, Kit, you and I have become more fine-tuned in terms of the story we want to tell. So I think you and I are mostly usually I feel like 98% of the time like we're on the same page about like the story we want to tell and whether or not the decision we're making like serves that story totally. um, like versus a lot lately right like like versus thinking of it like the best idea or not but like just more like the one that serves the, the story um but then yeah but then I sometimes we do get stuck on something so we'll have a we'll have a tiebreaker with Jessica <laughs> for sure I often think like um in terms of like collaborating and writing a musical like you know it's maybe one person writing the musical or two people or three maybe um at, at most when it's like that kind of team but like um we did not write this musical ourselves like Jessica and we have a dramaturg Natasha Sinha who has been with us for the last two years have been really guiding the process um and I don't know if you have uh, anything to say about that kind of collaboration, Jessica? Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting when an I when ideas are posed to me, it's it's not the first thing that comes to mind. It's not even like, do I like it or is that interesting? It's I start to track it. So if we change this, what does that mean, and how does that affect things? What's the ripple effect of that change, uh, and, and does that serve the larger the larger story? Uh, that we want to tell. So 
so a lot of the times when when they pose it to me it's like it takes it it takes like a minute it takes a little bit of time for me to just see how or i need to start to i need to actually talk it out loud okay so if we make that change that means this 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 okay okay and then sometimes i just want to try it try something you know or they want to try it we don't want to we don't want to put it we don't want to uh, actually stage it yet we don't even want to share it with the actors yet so so it has these these phases of of you know vetting or testing versus like they they're figuring out then they talk to me then sometimes we email or talk to natasha uh and then maybe they try it out and i read it and then they we, the three of us read it around the table and then we'll bring in the, one of the actors and we'll hear them have them read it and then we said make a few more changes and then we'll send it to the stage manager to do the full print and then we shared it with the whole cast and then even then there are changes and then I get on its feet. So every change has its, you know, there's a, there's a ramification and there's like a little, there's a ripple effect of, of how, it, cause we don't want some, some changes we can just say, oh, can you adjust that line here and there? But there's some bigger things that I also want to respect the process and say, we can't just like throw this whole new thing. Uh, we want to make sure it works. We want to try it out before we, we, you know, gut it. Was there any conflict ever between, and because um, I think writing a, a musical is very different than writing a play, but was there any conflict ever between the, the, the music and the, the book or the lyrics and the music? Like, I can understand like conflicts if you have you know, two people writing a play and not a musical, but I guess I'm wondering if there's any conflicts between like what you want the music to be, but then it doesn't fit into the book scenes or vice versa between and um because i think writing a, a musical is very really different than writing a play but was there any conflict ever between the 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 music and the someone's book someone or the music. lyrics and the music myself like <laughs> i can understand like conflicts if you have you know two people writing that's weird i think it's meredith's maybe i don't know maybe if meredith mutes with that <laughs> Was it delayed? Was that oh, we need to play Meredith. We need to play Meredith. Guys, you know what? You know <laughs> what? <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. She left. Yeah, she left. <laughs> wow. Oh. Um, out. <laughs> Shut it down. Oh, is she? Did she really leave? Yeah. Did she, She'll be she back. Really... <laughs> That was okay. a good thing. She didn't think she shut her computer and then it just shut off. Oh my gosh, I'm going to text right. her. The green window thing went to her, th so it sounded like it was delayed on hers. I was confused. Sorry. I'll oh shut up. God. Back on mute. Oh, she's back. She's back. Oh, God. Back. Is it better? <laughs> I, I, I don't know if it was you or not, <laughs> Meredith. I, 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 it was just, I, not, who knows what happened? I, it was weird. Um, maybe it was me for all I know. Um, but uh, yeah. that, uh, so just to answer your question, Lily, that happens all the time. That's actually why one of the, one of the songs that Adrian sings that has been there since 2012 was most recently cut, like in the fall. Um, like things like that happen all the time. It's like, if that just doesn't serve the story, it doesn't matter what a hit song, you know, it was. I mean, it was like a song that everybody loved. It was just like a fun song and so she was dancing to it. And like, uh, yeah, yeah. it's, uh, if it doesn't work, it just has to be. So when those, when those conflicts happen, again, just going back to like, does this serve the story that we wanna tell? Um, and, and then that should make the decision for you. A lot of my poetry was cut. <laughs> yeah, right, rightfully so. <laughs> uh, no one wants to, no one wants to watch a show with too much poetry. <laughs> I will say, I will say, I mean, the, the cast knows that uh, up until this production, uh, Kisses Bar Goodbye was at the top of the show. Um, and, and every time that happened, like, I, I would ask, you know, I would ask like my friends who'd seen previous workshops of it. And I would be like, oh, do you, do, do you remember the first song? And they'd be like, oh, it's Hello Open Road. Like, they, literally, the, the fact that it started with a poem just made it so that it was like, oh, like the show hasn't started yet. I don't remember a single word of it. And uh, so we moved it and I feel like people remember it now. Just strong totally. to move it to that, to like the first scene you see Adrian and Dad, so strong. 
See, the other thing is um, this show, because of its like auto semi autobiographical nature, um, it was written really differently than our other shows. So it, during this writing process, we just like wrote, we just like wrote songs, wrote poems, wrote scenes, wrote the story, and like wrote it down, and then weave that into, um, then created a larger arc and made a musical out of it. Um, I'd say like a big lesson that we learned from doing that and that we carried into our next musical was that uh, in our next musical, we spent so much more time working on the, the story and the outline and the characters and the world before we wrote the show. But I'm not saying that what we did in Interstate was wrong because that's the only way that could have been written yeah. um, because of the nature of the show. But in like for the next show that we did, I call, <laughs> Who that um, book? <laughs> we spent I'd say like six months in residencies and like fellowship environments working on story before writing a single sentence of the show yeah. sorry if Cole um, interrupted oh, sorry. my son Cole who Cole? drew the sign Cole. yay um, what an art sign is way better than mine <laughs> <laughs> They're saying your, 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 your sign is better than theirs. <laughs> so um, you were saying you, you did that for four months before you wrote any, like wrote a- Longer, uh -huh. like oh. half a year or so of just, mm -hmm. just story building then world building and outlining character, right. character sketches. So um, for those of you who don't know that, so that change happened, that change occurred in our rehearsal process, right? that Open Road became the first song. That's like the yeah. second day, right? What's that? Yeah, like on the second. Right. second day. Yeah, it was like second or third day, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think it, it was it was early on in the process for our process. And that's interesting that we were a part of, we've witnessed that. that. So how long had it been reversed? Like how long had Kiss, uh, since uh, years, since the beginning, actually, uh, Kisses Bar Goodbye was always the opening number. In oh, it was I see. A long poem before that. Like it a was very a really long poem. poem. It was much longer, and then it was shorter, and then it was blended in with something else. Uh, I see. I it, see. It had many iterations, but it was always the first one. I see. So that was that was the first that it was the first song for a long time, and then in our in our rehearsal process, um, the song that was the third song or the second song became the first song, the opening number. Um, so I lied, there's one more question. Um, and uh, it's from um, Nick. Through the writing and rehearsal process, what has the process been like choosing which aspects of the trans experience are portrayed in the show? Like with binding, Henry's search for testosterone, was it a balance between educating new audiences and showing an authentic queer experience? So how did you choose which aspects of the trans experience you included? And I think the question is, was it to educate or was it just part of the story or trying to show an authentic queer experience? Um, thanks for your question, Nick. I definitely say that um, like all the scenes that portray those kind of trans experiences are about story. They're about the journey that the characters go on and they're about what happens in people's real, like everyday lives. Um, you know, I, Melissa and I don't write in order to educate the audience, but we write with a great um, degree of awareness and responsibility to the audience, knowing that the things people say and hear and feel will get taken and absorbed by the audience and then become a part of their realities. Um, and so like putting something on stage really comes with a lot of responsibility. Um, and so I think like we really try to portray the characters in their worlds doing what they're gonna do. And then um, and then like, again, because it's making musical so collab a new musical so collaborative for us that like we add in Jessica's um, note and we add in the actors who play the roles and what their experiences are and that sort of informs everything that happens on the stage to to create like uh exactly what you see and i don't know if um other folks have some thoughts around that 
Uh, I guess I have a thought on, um, especially that injection scene um, was an interesting process hearing everybody in the room and knowing that we kind of had a duty to make the storytelling clear, but also not misrepresent any part of that story. And yeah, it is a fine line to walk to kind of not lose anybody in the audience, but not overdo anything for the sake of like communicating it to the, I, I don't, this is the wrong term, but like least woke person in the room, you know? It is interesting. We were talking about how some audiences, it would feel like it was a celebration of our communities and some audiences, it does feel more like you're teaching and sharing something mm -hmm. personal with a new crowd. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I often think in storytelling um, that the more the, the text serves the story, the more that those details, the specificities serve the story, then the more inherently it educates anyway. Because by capturing people through the story, um, they inherently open their hearts and are more empathetic and, and, are, and are more aware of, of what the story is, as opposed to just you know, feeding, to, to doing something just for the mere sake of educating. Yeah, we really try to assume that our audience is, is gonna meet the story where it's at and that they're, um, you know, like, we try to assume that everyone is like, uh, like intellectually going to, to be exactly where we are um, and, and have the conversations that need to happen after the show in order to, uh, for the show to mean something too. Great. Well, thank you so much to all of you for doing this. It was so great to see you all again. Yeah. And thanks to all of you at home for watching. And in closing out, um, <coughs> excuse me, in closing out, are there, again, I don't have coronavirus, I don't think, knock on wood. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And um, I, I, I would love to uh, just ask everyone, like, how are you? The, like the final parting words, how, any, any tips for all of us who, um, and how you're, you know, making the most out of your isolation? One thing I do want to say, I saw a really great, I saw many great posts about like, oh, like this is the time for people to go home and do things that they, that they want to do or need to do. Like read that book, listen to that podcast, like write that book, um, 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 like make, like be the, be productive in things that you want to be and like have your creativity like soar and fly. But I also a really great other post that was like, don't feel pressure to listen to that podcast, read that book, write that book. Um, which I think is equally as important. I think that definitely like the mentality of taking this time to get everything that you weren't, that, that you haven't been able to get done, done. I think is also another, like another source or another thing that's been influenced by capitalism where we have to keep working in this time of like pause. Um, because for me, I, I don't feel pressure coming home. Like I should play more piano. I should play guitar. I should like play harmonica. Like I should like do all these things <laughs> that I wouldn't have done otherwise. But I think also if like your body needs to rest and like your mind needs some R and R, like to take the time and do that. Um, and like with creativity, I know for me it's like I don't I don't necessarily I, I hope that it comes to me rather than having to like force it. Um, so that's why I'm like it, I'm trying to balance the two of like taking this time for myself but also like doing the things that I say I wouldn't have had time to do before as well so trying to find that balance that's all I would say thanks Sushma yeah anyone else have any good tips yeah I would say that uh very simply I'm learning to become really good friends with myself I'm one of those people who's been a hermit since I was a child. So, <laughs> so I'm kind of flourishing. Um, so if anyone needs video game recommendations or has any, please contact me. Um, <laughs> well, I don't, this may be before your time, Kai, but I've started and almost finished um, Zelda Ocarina of Time on Nintendo. Oh. 
the time I thought you were. Twice. So <laughs> oh the first God. time I, I, tr I, I tried finishing, I didn't finish because I, I started a job. And then I was pregnant with my son and not doing anything. So I tried to, I started it from the beginning because you had to start over again, right? Mm -hmm. If it's been a long time. I started from the beginning and tried to finish it. And then I had him and didn't finish it. So now I'm thinking it's time to take up a Nintendo 64 again and try to finish Zelda. Mm -hmm. You should play it with Cole. That would be so full. Yeah, circle. I was thinking that. I'm like, my husband said that. He's like, maybe Cole will like it too. I'm like, well, now that he's 10 and it's been 10 years since I, more than 10 years since I tried to finish Zelda, I can once again try try with him. Mm -hmm. Aw. Anyway. Um, so um, I, I like to uh, thank everybody for listening and we're gonna, we're gonna um, close up now. And we'll, like I said, Moo is trying to do this every Friday. So, but we'll keep you updated on that. And we'll try to keep this, um, our, our marketing and tech guru, Kevin Duong is, is uh, working this out now. Yay, hey, happy Kevin. for Kevin who's been producing this. Um, he's going to try to see if this can live on on our page so that if you missed any of it, you can go back and listen to it. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna log off for now from us. And if, if we all could stay on Zoom for a second, I'd like to take some photos and the photos of our signs, but I didn't get to do that before, if that'd be cool. And we can say goodbye like separately, that'd be great. <laughs> Yay, cool. great. Okay, bye everybody bye. out there. Thanks, Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Bye. bye.